Hello, welcome to The Armin Show, where we talk about everything science, human behavior, creativity, and more. Thanks for joining, and make sure to subscribe. Lee McIntyre, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. I'm glad to have you on. Your book is called On Disinformation, How to Fight for Truth and Protect Democracy. We are glad to have you on the program here in 2023. Democracy is important. How have you gotten to the place you are currently at in existence, the content you make, the things you speak about? How did you get to this point from your perspective? I spent many years as a philosophy professor writing about all the things in scholarship that professors write about when they know that you know their 40 closest friends are going to read it. And then I got interested in how to reach out to a larger audience. And so I started to become a public philosopher and write books about the truth problem in America and in the world these days about post-truth and denialism and you know all these sorts of things. And you know that really fascinated me because there's a philosophical angle to it, but it's also practically very important, I think. And then I thought that I had said what I needed to say. And then January 6th happened. And I realized that, you know, my focus, which, which had been for the most part on science denial, uh, had now really shifted to what I think of as reality denial. Because the same um, blueprint that the science deniers had used all those years to deny scientific facts, politicians were now using to deny other facts, like facts about elections. And that led me to wonder, you know, well, what other similarities might there be? I mean, why might this be the case? And I think I traced the problem back to its source, which, which is disinformation. That, you know, you look at the blueprint between the science deniers and the reality deniers, it's the same. But I think that the causal element is also the same, which is that they're both caused by people who have particular interests, sometimes economic or political or ideological, and they don't like the truth. They don't like what science and facts say. And so they start a strategic denialist campaign, which consists of lying, um, pretending that they're not lying, lying to share bad information, to try to get a group of people to deny that the truth is the truth. So that's how I landed here, because I really kind of started out as a philosopher of science and epistemologist, and then realized, you know what, these things really have great practical importance. For instance, science and democracy. Science has always been quite important to me. It's one of the tenets of this program. And I like science and research, getting to understanding from that. Now, from that example that you brought up there, let's say related to that election item, what would be the two sides? What would be the case that each side would make on that and why would one side be disinformative? What are your thoughts on both ends? You, you raise a good point because just as no denier ever admits that they're a denier, no disinformer ever wants to admit that they're a disinformer, right? Now, I think the relevant distinction here is this. Sometimes there are people who genuinely believe what they're saying. They just... Um, have been victimized by other people with bad information. So, the, you know, there are some anti-vaxxers, some flat earthers, some climate deniers who genuinely believe what they're saying. So I don't classify them as uh, disinformers. I mean, there are people who are, as I say, victimized by other people's uh, bad information. But then you have other people who know that what they're saying is a lie, who understand that the vaccines, the COVID vaccines don't have microchips in them, but they say it anyway, because it serves their political or economic or ideological end. You know, so th that's where I draw the distinction. And so what really matters to me is who I'm talking to. Am I, because I like to talk to people who disagree with me. Sometimes I end up talking to people who genuinely believe what they're saying. And in that case, they tend to say, no, you're not the scientist, I'm the scientist, or you're not the skeptic, I'm the skeptic. 
it's kind of that line from fiction where the villain is the hero of his own narrative. You know, they, they don't think that what they're doing is wrong. They think that I've missed the point. And sometimes they'll call me a denier. Um, so that's, you know, one way that conversation can go. Sometimes I end up talking to people who, under, who are cynical, who understand that what they're saying is false. Maybe they're a shill for the, uh, get for the uh, tobacco companies or the gas companies, you know, who you know don't want it to be true. Say that climate change is real, uh, or you know, uh, you you know. So you find this, you find spokespeople for a point of view that they don't think is true, but maybe they're getting paid for what they say. On this point here, how would one? I recently spoke with someone who has been on the show before. They're in a psychology class and there's a thing called the trap test that is T-R-A-A-P, timeliness, relevance, authority, accuracy, purpose, to look at the details behind something to figure out if it's factual or not or valuable or not. Um, how would one look at, as you're describing, let's say that president and if what they're saying is false, how, how are these things identified? Um, because one could say it the other way around, and then how would they know well, that it wasn't the other person? It's it's a problem um, because depending on the claim, some of the claims that people are lying about are very hard to verify. So sometimes, I mean, sometimes there are um, telltale signs, like if the person is spouting a conspiracy theory or if they're just cherry picking evidence that they know will uh, support their point of view, you know, then, then the, you know, that's a warning sign, even before you look at the content of what you're, of what they're saying, that, you know, maybe they're, uh, you know, they're, they're following the wrong chain of reasoning to get there. But I mean, y your question is a good one, because a lot of people going into factual d debates, assume good faith, and a level playing field. But what, and so, and for, look at how science works. Isn't that how scientific disputes work? I mean, scientists have disputes over facts all the time, but they don't accuse, usually, unless it's true, accuse one another of fraud or accuse one another of bad faith. They just have a disagreement over the facts. Now, how do they settle that disagreement? They have an agreed upon method for doing that, which is they consult the evidence and they, they're they willing to say to one another in advance, well, if you could show me this, then I'd change my mind. You know, so so there's, there's an agreed upon way to settle that dispute. Now compare that to a conversation um, like one between a, say, a physicist and a flat earther. That's not a level playing field and I don't, no pun intended there, right? It's and it, the reason it's not a level playing field is because the flat earther is not willing to say in advance what would convince them, usually, and they're not um, usually willing to change their mind even when you present evidence which shows that they're wrong, and they indulge in conspiracy theories and they cherry pick evidence, et cetera, et cetera. So the problem is that to somebody outside the debate, to a layperson. They can't tell who's telling the truth. They they maybe think, well, you know, you've got a good point and you've got a good point too. So, you know, how how do they decide that? Here, I think, is a good reason why it's important not to have um, media that engage in false equivalence, you know, where they'll have one of these televised debates with, you know, a split screen where both sides get equal time. Because when it's a factual issue, you have to earn your place at the table. It's not just, oh, well, you've got a contrarian point of view. So, you know, we should put a microphone in front of you and let you say whatever you want. Um, there's an excellent book out right now by uh, Sander Vanderlinden, who's one of the top cognitive scientists in the world, called Foolproof. And he, in his book, talks about the fingerprints, the DNA, if you will, of misinformation, how you can tell even before you can evaluate the content before you've even done any fact checking or testing, how you can tell whether something is likely to be misinformation. And, you know, it's a it's a fascinating 
uh, he's he's got kind of a fascinating account of how you how you do that, how you identify. It. Part of it's to learn to be a better uh, critical thinker. You know, when you're hearing information, you know, ask yourself, does the person want that to be true? Why do they want me to believe it? Is it because they have an interest in it? Is it because they think it's true? Is there anything I could do outside to check and see if they're correct? Those sorts of things. It's an important point here that the setup before the discussion is almost more important than the actual discussion because the setup, maybe the inflexibility towards something or not laying out what would convince that individual. That's right. It, it, it doesn't set up a level playing field for both to work through. Right. And now you're going into it already done in a way before it's even started. I'll give you an example. I mean, the denier wins just by getting a forum. Look at the recent um, uh, public uproar over um, RFK Jr., uh, you know, a virulent anti-vax person, you know, a vaccine denier who is insisting now with allies, with help from other people, that he have a debate with, you know, one of the leading vaccine scientists in the world. He thinks that, you know, he, he's got an equivalent set of credentials that he should be able to do that. Well, Peter Hotez is absolutely right to refuse to debate because RFK Jr. wins just by being on the stage. He doesn't have to win the debate. He doesn't have to say anything. He doesn't have to refute what Dr. Hotez says. He just has to have an equal size picture and a, a, the same you know, size microphone. And he wins because he's been able to spread his uh, bad information. Now, in his case, I don't know whether he's a misinformer or a disinformer, though I note that the Center for Countering Digital Hate in 2019 found that 65% of the anti-vax propaganda on Twitter was due to 12 people. And RFK Jr. was one of them. So, you know, there, there's an example, right? Um, it's a setup. If, if a, you know, if a scientist allows him or herself to get into a debate with a denier, you, you really can't win no matter what, because they're not, they're not going to change their mind. There was a famous debate on evolution years ago between, um, Bill Nye, and I think his name is Kenneth Ham. I'm not sure of his first name, but it was Ham, H-A-M-M, -M, about evolution. Mm -hmm. And at one point, um, <laughs> Nye said exactly the right thing, which is, is there anything I could say to make you change your mind? And Ham said, no, that's not a scientific debate. This is an important point that if there's nothing that can be done to alter a view, that view is cemented and then there's no actual uh, point of discussion there. Mm -hmm. One thing to go back to there is earlier you had mentioned like the equal microphone time. I've mm -hmm. thought of that in regards to some of the small groups that vocally have gotten a voice equal, even if the percent of that group was 1%, 0.2%, 0.4% of the population. But then when it comes to a speaking forum, suddenly it's almost 50-50 in a way, which seems yeah. heightening on their end and completely lowering on the other end. What are your thoughts on that matter? Well, it's, it's basically the same point, I think, that I, that I just made, which is that, um, and I mean, this is really a social media point too, isn't it? Because the internet gives everyone a microphone. You know, it allows somebody who, you know, 25 years ago would have been out on a street corner handing out mimeograph sheets to have a website and followers and maybe organize a conference and to have a much bigger voice. And so, you know, there's the, the worst thing with disinformation is amplification. I don't think you can cre stop people from creating it. I'm not even really sure you can stop people from believing it once they hear it. Some people will just do that, given the cognitive biases of, you know, in the human brain. But I think the the area that we're going to have the most um, success with is stopping the amplification. And of course, today in the news, the big story, the the huge story, lead of all the newspapers, 
is this federal judge in Louisiana who just ruled that the Biden administration can have no contact at all with the social media companies because they're trying to censor conservative voices. Now, this whole thing was over vaccine disinformation that was on Twitter and Facebook during the pandemic and the Biden administration trying to save people's lives by keeping them from hearing this disinformation. But all of a sudden, this debate has become politicized. All of a sudden, you know, the ability to share vaccine disinformation is now protected political speech. I, d I don't understand that. I don't understand. I mean, I'm a great advocate of the First Amendment, but I don't think that the First Am Amendment allows you to, to express opinions that are so dangerous that they result in loss of life. I mean, it's the old equivalent of shouting fire uh, in a crowded theater when there's no fire. Uh, I mean, we have to figure out where that line is and we have to be careful of where we, you know, where we, we draw that. But the idea that Biden was trying to um, censor conservative voices is laughable. And, and I ask, why are the conservatives the ones who are in with the disinformers on vaccines? I mean, who wants to be with that crowd, right? I mean, who, who defends the right of a disinformer to lie unless you're one of them? I just, I don't understand that. Hmm. One thing that comes to mind is if there were individuals on that end, uh, a percentage of individuals on that end, what would you tell them is off on their thinking or what's the, because they're, you know, there are people on yeah. all ends they're, they're, of this they're, item. You, no, you, you're, you're right. And, and you're not both sides in it. You're, you're forcing me to contend with the fact that an awful lot of people disagree with me. Here's, mm -hmm. here's, a point, here's a point I'd like to make to everyone out there listening to this who is a conservative or a radical free speech advocate or an anti-vaxxer. Okay, this is, uh, I think, uh, let me make this point. Um, the judge's ruling in this case, I don't think was made to fight against censorship. I think what it did was it promoted giving a microphone to disinformers. Because the, you know, the, the result of what has happened now is that there will be more disinformation on the Internet. And I want to pause here to think, just to say the obvious, which is why is that a problem? And the reason I think that's a problem is that, look at it this way, why don't people like censorship? It's because you might not hear the truth. It's not just that people think they have a God-given right to say whatever they think. It's because when you censor people, you're censoring potentially someone who might have the answer, and so you'll miss it. But <clears throat> won't you miss it if there's disinformation? I mean, I've said in my book, um, one of the uh, short <laughs> sentences in the book is that in a free society, disinformation is the new censorship. You can take away the truth by hiding it, you know, by, by censoring it. You can also take away the truth by overwhelming it with falsehood so that people can't even tell that, that, you know, the truth is there. So, the, you know, the, the idea that, re, you know, suppose the social media companies refused to give anti-vax disinformation, uh, you know, a, a place on their platform. That's not censorship. That's refusing to amplify someone else's lie. And, and I know that to you know, another person say, well, no, what you're saying, you know, is, is lying. But when it's a matter of actual, you know, a factual question, there are ways to settle those disputes and you don't settle them through debate. You settle it through science. There's some perspective here. Could it be like almost a different layers of looking at something 
that is the case versus as much of a clashing but like looking at different uh, uh levels give, give, of, me, give me an example if you would like could it be related to uh like one is much more hmm, an example stuff but more down to like base daily framework and one is more like broad natured like kind of um maybe short term versus long term or uh yeah, right I now mean, in the now mm -hmm. you you do you do have debates like that i mean even in the anti vax debate you had some people who their main objection was, don't tell me what to do. Now, I can't argue with that. That's not a scientific question. They weren't disputing that the vaccines were efficacious. They weren't disputing that, they, they weren't saying that they had mi tracking microchips in them, which is false. It was based on a conspiracy theory from the Russian government that little tidbit of disinformation. So they, they weren't saying anything like that. They were simply saying, you can't tell me what to do. That's a different level. I'm, I'm making a scientific point and they're making a, a normative point or a political point or, or even an ethical point that, you know, does the government have the right to force you to take a vaccine if you don't want to take it? That, that's a perfectly legitimate political debate that we could have. That's not a scientific debate. That's, by the way, not a factual debate, I think, because it depends on what we value. Do we value individual freedom more than, you know, collective good? Well, you know, I think th that also comes up in the censorship debate, doesn't it? Because sometimes, you know, we will let that one person talk and talk and talk and not censor them, even though what they're saying is disagreeable to the whole, you know, whole group of people. So, so it, it depends, you know, how much do we, do we value one individual versus the group? That's a political debate. You know, another time this sort of thing could come up, I guess, is, um, you know, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there because I, I, it was a hard question. And if I gave you one answer to it, that's probably good enough. That's a cool one there. One thing that just came to my mind is whose uh, voice or which end of this discussion is getting the majority of the public discourse in 20, like right now in 2023? I don't know. Where is the loudest end or is it like 50 50 at this time boy i wish i knew i mean the the pro how do you even assess something like that yeah i suppose you could look at polling um the trouble is that people who agree all talk to one another and they don't talk with people who they disagree with and so how do you even get a sense of how many people there are out there not to mention the fact that sometimes the people have the loudest voice when they're they don't necessarily represent the most people so you know, that that's a i mean that's a very difficult thing to measure i mean you you could say look you could say that in some ways it doesn't matter that we don't decide scientific questions based on you know a, a public opinion poll just as we don't decide individual rights on a public opinion poll. I mean, that's why they call them rights. You know, if, if I have the right to free speech and everybody hates what I'm saying and they tell me to shut up, I still have that right. It, it shouldn't be subject to, you know, a vote in the group whether I should shut up. I mean, that's, you know, that's how rights work. So, yeah, I, I'm, uh, I think that's about it on that one. One thing I wanted to bring up is, I think maybe you've spoken with Michael Shermer before. I've spoken with Michael Shermer. Yes. He's skeptical. He's a favorite. He's super duper. Now, as far as being skeptical, <laughs> what can the average individual do today so that they are matching reality 
as closely as possible in what they are seeing, what can you do as an individual? Subscribe to Skeptic. That's one thing you can do. <laughs> I gave him a nice plug there. I know I know Michael. He's a, he's a good man. Um, I think try to embody the attitude of the skeptic. I mean, one reason that I enjoy skeptic and skeptical inquirer is because they are hard on people's beliefs. They're hard on their own beliefs. You know, they, they go into a discussion with the criteria in mind of, you know, am I crazy? I, am I wrong? What, what would I have to, what would I have to f find out to, you know, to give up my belief? I, look, I, I'm, I'm not going to pretend to be objective on that. I mean, I love that point of view because, I, and in fact, I think that that's the hallmark of science. That's what I think makes science science is the ability to say, um, I care about evidence and I care about evidence so much that I'm willing to change my mind if you show, if you show me that I should. And isn't that really what the skeptic is doing? I mean, people sometimes, the caricature of a skeptic is a person who just doesn't believe anything. But a skeptic is somebody who has high standards. But once that standard is met, then they believe. Because that's part of skepticism too, I think. And nobody really ever talks about this. But uh, I'm, I'm interested in something, this will go back to my nerdy uh, uh, scholarship and philosophy days. Um, something that philosophers call warrant. You know, in a, in a world in which you can't have proof and certainty, you still need to be able to form beliefs. And how do you form beliefs? Understanding that any empirical belief could be disproven by future evidence. I mean, that's just how inductive reasoning works. We live in a fallibilist world. You know, you, you, could, you could disprove any scientific hypothesis. Otherwise, it's not really scientific, you know, pace Karl Popper. But that doesn't mean we can't believe anything. It means that we only believe things when they have sufficient warrant. We choose to believe the hypothesis that has the greater evidence, understanding that we're holding it tentatively, that it could be proven wrong. That doesn't mean that we don't have a strong conviction, say, if it's you know, got a lot of data in its favor and it's held up over time. It just means that someday, in order, to, if you're a scientist, you're always willing to say, if you could show me this, I'll change my mind. There's a, there's a famous, um, I'm going to get the science wrong on this, uh, the, the quotation wrong, but uh, there was a, um, a famous biologist where they asked him, what would it take to prove to you that evolution wasn't true? And he said, rabbit fossils in the Precambrian era. That's pretty specific. You know, I mean, you know what you would have to do to, to show you know, you, you could go out and start to dig and you can dig and dig and you're probably never going to find that. But if you could, you would, I think it was Dobzhansky, you, he would, you know, give up his belief. I respect that. I admire that. And that's something that I think that um, the true skeptics have. Um, deniers, especially science deniers, tend to be, they see themselves as skeptics, but they're really not. They misunderstand skepticism. They, they tend to, they're what I call cafeteria skeptics. They go through the cafeteria line and they pick out certain things to be skeptical about because they're only skeptical about the things they don't want to believe. But then when it's something they do want to believe, they're not skeptical at all. That, that's the problem. It's a kind of an inconsistency, a double standard uh, about belief. Hmm. Now, one thing I had thought of before I was reading your material is my mind jumped from the title to artificial intelligence and yeah. the category that we currently have Thank you. as the broad natured item that connects with potential disinformation because then soon you can have a video of me talking, <laughs> saying something else or who knows what kind of right. variety and it's happening very rapidly. Uh, how relevant is that in the upcoming five years? And is that louder than any other items that come to mind as far as potential disinformation? It scares the hell out of me. Because 
first thing I did when chat GPT came up, you know, for the public, I tried as hard as I could to get it to produce disinformation because that was the first thing I was worried about. So I, I would ask questions about, um, does the MMR vaccine cause autism? Are there tracking microchips in the COVID vaccines? I mean, I, I worked it, there was smoke coming out of the machine. I was trying to get it to produce disinformation and I could not get it to do it. And the way I understand that it works is it scrapes the internet for you know all the information that's out there you know, kind of this big soup, and then it reflects it back in, you know, good English in a nice organized model. And the fact that there was nothing there, that it didn't even say, though some believe, you know, or, you know, according to Andrew Wakefield, I mean, it didn't do that. It just said, you know, it was like, I'd ask the CDC, it said, no, there is no evidence in favor of the hypothesis that the MMR vaccine causes autism. This debunked theory was due to Andrew Wakefield, who, and it just went, I mean, it just gave the answer that you would, you know, expect from a scientist, which led me to the following conclusion. Somebody messed with it. They messed with it in a good way. The people who are in charge of ChatGPT didn't just let it go wild. They chose certain things that were hot button things where they were not just gonna let it do what it would ordinarily do. Vaccines are one. I've identified a, you know, a few others, which I'm not gonna go into, but I mean, I really tried. Conspiracy theories, everything. Um, and what that suggests to me is that if you can mess with it, to make it give a good, true answer. You can also mess with it the other way. Large language models in the wrong hands will be a nightmare. It will be an apocalypse for disinformation. Because what it will do, I mean, if you think about how it, disinformation is produced, one of the biggest barriers a lot of disinformation comes out of Russia and out of the Soviet Union before. They are, uh, one of their principles of warfare is to engage in constant information warfare against their adversaries. Not just about military things, but about science, about you know a lot of other things. And so one of the barriers um, in the Russian production of disinformation is that they didn't have enough people who spoke perfect English. And, you know, th this, I mean, when you wanted to be a, a troll in one of their troll farms, you had to take a test in English and people didn't pass. It's not a problem anymore. Now you don't even need a troll farm. You need a troll garden because you can have one guy, one officer in the SVR who speaks perfect English with, you know, 50 windows of chat GPT open, or not that one, but a different one, the e, it's evil twin, and can pr produce enough disinformation to, you know, to keep Twitter busy. That's the problem. So the volume of disinformation will go up and the quality of disinformation will go up too. You know, you look at some of the memes from 2016 when the Russians were hacking the election. Uh, one of them was from an organization called Black Matters. <laughs> Didn't say Black Lives Matter, it said Black Matters. So you look at that and you think, something wrong with that. That's probably disinformation. That kind of thing's not gonna happen anymore. The, you know, the, the, the mistakes of a non-native speaker of whatever language you're producing the disinformation in will, will uh, not be there anymore. And so, it, it will be an incredibly difficult problem. And there's one more aspect of it, in case I haven't scared you badly enough already. People will not only, once the problem gets bad enough, they will not only take bad information for true, they will take true information for fake. They won't believe video. They won't believe audio. And when, even when it's good, 
And once we reach that point, then I think we're in 1984. Then I think people become, Hannah Arendt talked about this in Origins of Totalitarianism. We can't even know the truth. It's not that we are taking true for false or false for true. We're just stepping back and saying, there's so many lies that we can't even discern the truth. So I might as well just check out and not even believe or not be involved or whatever the leader says is okay. That's the really dangerous thing. So I, I think that social media has been kind of a disaster for disinformation. It's been great for other things. AI has also been great. They're now using it to diagnose pancreatic cancer three years in advance. They could never do that before. But it's going to be a disaster for disinformation. The multiplication effect is something that comes to my mind because anything can be, everything is so specific now. You're either, you should be hyper specialized on a topic you bring up. Anybody can be multiplied 100 times beyond their voice yeah. as opposed to 15 years ago. The, the compounding effect of nearly everything yeah. is substantial. So either you're in the fringes and unnoticed or like, one of the key figures and everybody's paying attention. And then so if you send out something that's not the most matching reality, you're almost making it a lot of people's reality. Then they're starting to tell their people yeah. about it. And then it, it becomes it almost framework. becomes real. Yeah, right. I like the way you said it. It becomes their reality because they have to deal with it. They have to deal with the perception that it's true. I, I don't know if you're a, a movie fan. Do you like the Indiana Jones movies? Yeah. I recently wore a hat and somebody told me I look like Indiana Jones, but I don't know them too well, but I know the, the concept. Yeah. Okay. So one of the Indiana Jones, I just saw the most recent one and I'm a fan and it was really good. But one of the, one of the earlier movies was called, uh, I'm going to get the title wrong here for, for being a fan, but it was the one in which he was searching for the Holy Grail. I guess it was called Indiana Jones and the, and the Holy Grail. That's probably I think what it was called. And, and if, if you've seen the movie, I'm not going to ruin it for you. But if you haven't seen it, I'm going to ruin it here. He gets into the room and there's the Holy Grail. But he doesn't know which one it is because there are a hundred fakes around it. That's the problem with disinformation. Censorship is when you take the Holy Grail off the shelf and you hide it in your backpack and Indiana Jones comes in and he can't find it because you've hidden it. This information is when you leave the Holy Grail there and you hide it in plain sight because you put up a hundred fakes around it. That's the problem. This is a great metaphor that has been brought up. I've been doing a lot of metaphors and analogies as of late and before, but it really paints the picture in a clear way. Right, one is like a reductive, one is additive. Yeah. And so then you're looking at everything and not 100% sure versus it's yeah. not there. The and truth so is no right there in front of you. It's right there, but you can't tell. That's what I meant, by the way, when I said disinformation is the new censorship. You look at China's model. They censor the internet. They, they take out the information. Well, they also use a lot of disinformation against their adversaries. I don't know how much they use internal to their country. But in a free society where you can't censor, you do what Steve Bannon said. You flood the zone. You, you, you get as much crap out there as possible. This is a tech, tactic in Russian uh, disinformation. It's called the fire hose of falsehood. If you ever listen to Putin give an answer about, you know, did you poison so-and-so? He won't give a straight answer. He'll say, that kind of poison isn't even produced in this country. And if he was poisoned, he was poisoned by Germany. And I've heard that poison isn't really effective. And I've heard, you know, you're just one after the lie, 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 lie. And they're, they can be inconsistent with one another. But it just, it's a fire hose. It overwhelms people. Go, Which of those are true? Do we really have to chase down each one of those and debunk them until the only one that's not debunked is the truth? That's how he found the Holy Grail, by the way. <laughs> he had a criteria to go through it. Not that one, not that one, not that one. Must be this one. But I mean, that's exhausting. If you had to do that for every single thing that you wanted to verify, you'd just stay home and put the covers up over your head. 
that that point right there is there's something to that which is good which that which is exhausting doesn't tend to develop as strongly it has more of a temporary nature to it because the things that are smooth and frictionless in life continue forward and the things that are exhausting or full of friction they don't have as much push like they're gonna run out is there something to that that if there is no. something in that category it'll get cleared out i i don't know i mean i, th I think a lot about authoritarianism and fascism and totalitarianism you know what wh what are the dangers and I, I again i can't quote it from memory i've got the book behind me but then i couldn't find the page but hannah hannah Arendt said the ideal sub i saw this is not a direct quotation but she said the ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced communist or the convinced nazi but the person for whom fact and fiction, true and false, you know, doesn't matter. It's that person with the blanket over their head. That's the one who's the subject of totalitarian rule. Not the person, not necessarily the person, not only the person who's the convinced person that, you know, agrees with you. I mean, think about how terrible prop, I don't know if you've ever uh, uh, lived in a country or been in a country where they have propaganda and it just looked like it's so ridiculous who could possibly believe that but the point of propaganda is not to convince you it's to show you who's boss Jason Stanley said that in his book How Propaganda Works it's because it's showing I'm so the government's so powerful you can't even fight this and if you can't fight it it might as well be true. It's the, as you were saying before, that's your reality. It's not actually the reality if the government says, you know, we had a grain surplus of whatever it was, but you're starving. Your reality is you're starving. But the reality you're forced to deal with on a daily basis is you can't get what you need because even though the government says, oh, you know, there are no lines at the shops or, you know, oh, we have a surplus. It's this. And, and here's where I think, here's what I think Aaron's point was. That's a society that is so demoralized and so cynical that they'll finally just say, yeah, whatever. Take away my freedom, but feed me. Tell me what's true, but, you know, don't, don't let me die. Those are people that you can rule. People who are demoralized and cynical. People who have given up. The problem is that I think that that's the goal of disinformation. I think that what's happening right now in the United States is the first successful domestic disinformation campaign. We fought information wars before with foreign governments, and our military is pretty good at that, which is why I called the book How to Fight for Truth and protect democracy, because I think those are the stakes. And I'm not the only one who thinks that. One of the um, leading disinformation researchers in the world, Joan Donovan, uh, recently of Harvard, was testifying before US Congress. Um, and in part of her testimony, she said that the, the greatest threat, the current threat was disinformation and the cost of doing nothing was democracy's end. Those, I think, are the stakes. Meanwhile, Congress won't do anything. Meanwhile, judges are ruling that Biden can't even talk to the social media companies and are in some ways running their own, you, you know, the, the Congress is running its own disinformation campaign, you know, uh, Jim Jordan and such. Meanwhile, the media refused to even use the word disinformation. I heard it really for the one of the first times on some of the broadcasts today. Uh, there's a, a broadcaster on MSNBC at 4 p.m., Nicole Wallace. She does a great job. She always draws this appropriate distinction between misinformation and disinformation. The others tend to just use the word misinformation, like a euphemism, because then it absolves them of the responsibility of seeing who's responsible. If it's disinformation, it's a lie. And if there's it's a lie, then there's a liar. They'd have to say who the liar is. They don't want to do that. 
So they say misinformation, which means that they're misinforming the American public. When they talk about vaccine misinformation, well, what if I told you that the, the story about um, tracking microchips in the COVID vaccines came from Russian intelligence? That's not misinformation anymore. That's disinformation. They knew that it was true and used it as a weapon of information warfare. Why aren't the cable TV broadcasters talking about it in that way? Why do they continue to say misinformation as if, well, you know, people are just confused. I don't know where this comes from. They, they treat this problem like it was a natural disaster. They, they cover it the same way they would a hurricane. They should be covering it the way they do a war. Interesting point on that one. What would be... If you were giving a speech to those who, let's say, in the description brought up, were misinformed by, let's say, Donald, mm -hmm. what would you inform them mm -hmm. for their uh, lively well-being? Yeah, that's a good question. If I had one message to give to, to any denier, it would be, you're being duped, you're being fooled. Look into it. Ask yourself why the person telling you this information wants you to believe it. Now, that little bit at the end there sounds like a conspiracy theory, and that's on purpose, because deniers are conspiracy theorists. And so, you know, if I can push that button, you know, they're already skeptical, they're already conspiracy theorists, they're already sensitive about being lied to. If I could get them to think, wait a minute, what if that thing that you heard was false? Uh, the, the, the thing that you heard and believed and that, you know, killed somebody that you know, what if that was a lie? You know, what if the person who invented that lie was a foreign government? Wouldn't, you know, wouldn't that bother you? And yeah, well, let's look into it together. So, I mean, they, they, I think that sometimes people, they, they, they don't want to know the truth. They don't want to look into it. They, and if you live in a news silo, you know, you don't have to. You can just hear how wrong the other side is. And I'm not saying there, by the way, that the, um, you know, that Fox News is the only partisan outlet. I've, I've heard some very terrible reporting on MSNBC where they cherry pick out something, engage in confirmation bias. I mean, they're, they're not, even things that are facts, they're not sharing because it doesn't fit the narrative. It's uh, pretty much the only program that I can stand is Nicole Wallace. She's very good. Factual. Is it characteristic of someone like Nicole Wallace, do they bring uh, both sides to the material, or is it that they look in more detail hmm. at the facts? It's What's, interesting. What are some of the She's there? a former Republican. Um, she was a spokesperson, uh, um, um, a uh, an aide to George W. Bush. She was one of the handlers for Sarah Palin during the uh, um, John McCain campaign. So I mean, so, so she was a Republican. Uh, operative worked in the White House, and her program is called Deadline White House. But she was so scandalized by Donald Trump that she gave it up. So you, it's interesting when you, when you talk about both sides there, because I don't think that she has to force herself to, to hear what the point, what the rebuttal point would be you know, to imagine what the, the talking point is going to be on the other side. I think she knows because she used to write them. And the thing that I admire about the way that she does her reporting is that it is relentlessly evidence-based questioning. She will not back down from asking the hard question no matter who it is. Are there any qualities that are left out from the evidence-based end 
of the spectrum of individuals that they could improve upon in the current time. Sure. What might those be? Uh, I, we saw this in the pandemic. Just the assumption that because you're an expert, somebody should listen to you. Or that, that because the science has been done and you know all the results look like they're going in a particular way, that you can go out to the public and say, well, this has been proven, so you should do this. Because if you're wrong, that ends up looking like a lie. I think that you know my my main one of my main um, areas of concern in the last few years has been science communication, because as much as I admire scientists, sometimes they are not good science communicators. Sometimes they will either walk away from people who disagree with them because they think they don't have anything to, you know, that they're idiots. Why should I talk to them? Why should I waste my time? That's not good science communication. But when they do communicate sometimes, it is not with much nuance. And, the, the, and I'm going to be specific here about something that I, that I care about a lot. I think that one of the um, main features of, that makes science as strong as it is is the ability to wrestle with uncertainty. To have a theory, have testing, have belief without having proof. So I think that that means that, you know, every scientist in their soul, you know, understand that there are error bars around scientific statements and that future evidence could prove you wrong. So why is it that when we go out in public, why is it that when scientists go out in public, I'm not a scientist, they say sometimes, well, this has been proven Because that just, because then someone will ask for the proof and you can't show it. All you can show is the evidence. And then if they can come up with one study that suggests that there's a problem with the evidence, then they feel justified in rejecting the whole thing. So I think that science communication has to embrace the idea of uncertainty, has to really own it, and stop apologizing for uncertainty. It's not a bad thing. Scientists sometimes change their mind. What else would you have them do when new evidence comes in? That's a good thing that they change their mind. If you want people to wear masks during a pandemic, um, I think that the best thing to do is to say, you know, what the evidence is. Not just to say the conclusion, you, you have to wear a mask because this will save your life and if you don't wear one, you know, you'll die. I mean, that's a caricature. Nobody said it quite that way, but pretty damn close sometimes. I mean, I, I think that people are smart enough that if you present the evidence in a careful way, that, that will sometimes convince them when ramming it down their throat would not. Now, some people will just never be convinced. But, you know, I, I did a whole book on talking to science deniers and discovered that if you try to ram facts down somebody's throat, it will never work. The only thing that works, it doesn't always work or even usually work, but the only thing that has a, a chance of working is calm, respectful conversation where you listen as much as you speak and engage the person face to face if possible. That's the only thing that might possibly work. This one's a great point. I have to add in, in relation to that, that I have experience with that in that, let's say 10, 15 years ago, I would try to give relationships and dating advice to certain individuals and it was completely disregarded. And I'm going to be talking with a, an expert in that in August on the incel community and their qualities. But the way to get through to someone is not whatever I was doing because it was being uh, met with pushback versus what you're describing here. Uh, meeting them calmly where they are and lightly and not trying to get something through because I got nowhere in that category, for example. It, it de I mean, it depends on what the goal is. If the goal is to convince them it's not going to work. Sometimes the goal is to feel better, to make the other person, you know, look like an idiot that, you know, but doesn't work, doesn't convince them. Right. 
right? The goal is important. Yeah. I was looking to be assistive, but right, the way you do it matters as well. Yeah. Very true. If you were to summarize, what would be a message you would want people to take away from on this information for their day-to-day -day living? It's a big threat. There's a difference between mis- and disinformation. So always ask yourself, where is this coming from and who wants me to believe this? And I, this is something we haven't talked about yet. Understand that there's something that you can do about it. You, you don't have to just wait for the government or the media or the social or the technology companies to save us. There are things that individual citizens can do, one of which is to toughen up their own thinking. I've got a friend, Andy Norman, who wrote a book called Mental Immunity, where he has a whole program for how to work on your own uh, resilience to mis- and disinformation. This is based on uh, some of the work that Sandra Vanderlyn and others have done that I cited earlier. Um, you can also reach out to you know, the people who are not doing a good job, write to your cable TV company, write to your person in Congress, vote. You know, be be somebody who's a loud voice. I, I am continually tweeting at MSNBC, stop saying misinformation when you mean disinformation. Or, you know, please note the difference between mis and disinformation. I don't know if anybody's heard me. Someday I want to get on Nicole Wallace's show, if only to say thank you for doing it the right way. The, 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 you asked me to summarize. I'll, I'll give you one sentence. Note the distinction between mis- and disinformation. And I'll, and I'll give you another sentence. There's one more. There's one more. This is even more important. The only way to win an information war is to understand that you're in one. If you if you think that what's happening is an accident or, a, you know, it's a hurricane or a tornado, it's nothing you can do but hide in your cellar. But if it's a war, there's something you can do to fight back. And at the end of my book, I give 10 practical steps that the ordinary citizen can take to fight back against disinformation. The most important of which is the one I just gave you. It, understand who you're up against. The, there are forces at work producing and amplifying disinformation to try to get you to believe false things because it serves their benefit, not yours. I like that point very much. I have to say on knowing what you're in when you're in something mm -hmm. is so substantial. It's almost like the pre-item before anything tends to be as substantial or more than the actual item because what you go into something with is I would say 80% of it and then what you actually bring to it at the time is only 20% even though we have the idea that what we are in that moment is 80% of it and the stuff we brought is just a little bit from the past I think the yeah. preparation and the thought is Sun, big, Sun big Tzu, the art of war the battle is won before it's fought <laughs> and, and also Mike Tyson everyone has a plan before he gets hit right you have to be able to adapt you have to be able to be flexible whatever your plan is going in You've got to be willing to change it depending on uh, on what happens. What I would like people to do is simply not necessarily to have a, that, that I need them to have a plan. It's just to be, to wake up to the fact that we're in an information war and have been for some time. There are things to read about this. There's a story in uh, the New York Times from a few years back called Putin's Long War Against American Science. Very important article to read because it makes clear uh, how long this has been in the making. There's another book, I'm not gonna hold up my own again. There's another book that I've been reading, The Handbook of Russian Information Warfare. This is a free book through NATO. You can get it online, you can look, anybody can get this. You, you can get a free copy just like this, just by writing to NATO, they'll mail it to you for free, free shipping. You can also get it online. And what this is, is a soldier's manual. Uh, it's for their, their soldiers and their commanders to understand what they're up against. And there are all sorts of things in here that, you know, that, I mean, the whole, practically the whole book is highlighted for me because what it makes clear is that 
one of the principles of Russian warfare is constant information war. And we have been in that for decades. Scary book, maybe even scarier than mine. <laughs> that, that's funny. Informative. Informative is key. Lee McIntyre, I would like to thank you for having joined on this discussion regarding on disinformation items related to that, the information we take in, processing it, who we are getting it from, and understanding the difference between disinformation and misinformation. Thank you. And if anybody would like to reach me, you can find out more about my work or my schedule or other things I've written or how to contact me at my website, leemcintyrebooks.com. I will link to that in the bottom of the description and there will be various information. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Glad to have had you on. Thanks for having me. And we are out. The Armin Show is a culmination of so many of my discussions with thoughtful individuals, knowledgeable individuals, creative individuals, people who have something to say in a category that they have put effort into maybe for years, maybe for decades. A lot of experience comes through. I like finding the links between people and topics of discussion in the categories that you have come to recognize. We're glad to continue the show, to branch out, to expand, to have more links between individuals, to have bigger groupings of individuals together in different formats so that the show becomes more of a show. And as we continue to do this, we're always glad for your support along the way. The Army Show is something that has developed from all my past efforts, blogging, making videos, audios, and has reached to this point where there are now hundreds of episodes with people or just with myself, bringing knowledge, sometimes entertainment, information, something that can help us progress forward in the categories that I tend to cover. Hope you enjoy it, and onward we go. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please comment any takeaways you had, and we'll see you on The Armin Show next time.